we are now going to begin the third part of this uh, track two morning. Um, and so to introduce Craig, all I'm going to say is abstract syntax trees, abstract syntax trees, abstract syntax trees. And if you can say that three times fast, I will be very impressed with you because I just had to practice for the last five minutes in order to do that. But um, without further ado, please give a warm round of applause to welcome Craig to the stage. Morning. Hi, how's it going? Still morning, yeah. Welcome, thanks for coming. Um, there's a bunch of good talks on and there's another really great one next door, so thank you for coming to listen to me blab. Um, I'm Craig. I do JavaScript to trade me every day, um, and I'm on Twitter. Don't follow me, you'll regret it, but that's okay. So let's start with the story. Um, if any of you in the room don't know Harry Potter stuff, you, you may be a bit lost, but hopefully the other stuff makes sense as well. <laughs> Congratulations, um, you're a wizard, all of you, witch, wizard, warlock, pick a word. You're that now. You went to Hogwarts. You know Dumbledore and uh, friend Harry Potter. But there's a problem. Uh, Lord Voldemort, the bad guy, he's put a curse on Harry. And now he's stuck in the internet and he doesn't know JavaScript. <laughs> and that looks a little bit like this. Let's see if this works. All right, Harry, stuck in the internet. Oh, please don't tap. OK. So Harry is, hopefully we all know, speaks parcel tongue, which is a language where you can talk to snakes. And it just so happens, for the purposes of this talk, that it's uh, also a Turing complete programming language. <laughs> so yeah, I, I accidentally invented a language for this talk. Um, we'll roll with it, we'll see how it goes. Um, hopefully you can understand it. But basically it's a fairly straightforward language. It's horrible. Uh, variable declarations have three S's, why not? Functions are pretty much similar. They uh, identifier in some sort of array type thing. Uh, it's still got like strings and numbers and booleans, and you can call functions and they do things. So hopefully you can see it's kind of similar to JavaScript in some way. It's got control flow, so um, an else if statement is just <laughs> six s's in a row. Um, a while loop is just five s's. It's kind of horrible, but let's again let's roll with it. Uh, you have these loops, so you have this. So the um, tilde and the greater than sign are kind of the assignment operator. They're used for like returning from things, so the function returns from it. Um, oh, I can use my wand. Function returns from it. <laughs> um, uh, so assignment does the same thing, and also it's used for like declaring ranges of loops, which, all right, let's pretend that's a good thing. Um, it's also got a type system which is identical to JavaScript, so that fixes some issues that we might have had otherwise. So Harry, because he can only speak parcel tongue and he's stuck in the internet, he's trying to like make up these complex spells in parcel tongue to try to fight that curse and break out of the internet. And so on the left we have a little script that just takes a spell expecto patronum, which is a great spell, and just does it a bunch of times but with more exclamations. So hopefully it works better. And on the right is the um, equivalent JavaScript of what that thing would create. But of course. We have a problem, so internet browsers don't understand puzzle tongue, and probably neither do any of us, which is probably good. So let's have a look at what happens. I've got this page here. Hopefully you can see some stuff. And on that page, we just included um, a script, which has the puzzle tongue directly inside it. And of course, we get an unexpected identifier, and something freaks out, because it's not JavaScript. So we're going to have to come up with a way to take the parcel tongue that Harry is using and turn that into JavaScript so that he can escape the internet. So we have parcel tongue at the start, and we're going to do something in the middle, and we're going to hopefully end up with JavaScript. It's terrifying. We don't know what we're doing. Um, it's, we'll see how we go. So let's try a really, really dumb idea. Let's just use some regex. Um, this is going to be try it. We'll um, just take a line at a time, basically. And we'll split that array up, and then we will try some things. OK, this is looking not too horrible. So we could like look for some white space, and then the three s's that we know is a variable, and then some characters, and then a space, and then a assignment operator, another space, and whatever's left. And hopefully we get a match. And then we write up some JavaScript. That doesn't sound too bad. Like, that might work a bit. 
And then we have a loop, all right? So we could look for the five S's and then a variable and then the identifier for that variable and then an assignment operator and then all the rest of the stuff. It's starting to get a little bit interesting. We've got this weird dangling brace at the end. Don't know what we're going to do with that. Functions, similar thing. Um, horrible regex. And what do we do with the blocks? How do we know what's going on? So if you noticed before, parcel tongue as a language is indentation matters, basically. It's like Python. It's like CoffeeScript. So we don't actually know when the end of a block is. Hmm. How do we do around that? So we're basically not going to have a very good time. So it's going to look a little bit like this. So if I run my script, do it like that, we basically have split it up into chunks and then done some regex and got a bit of code. It's definitely not going to run. There's like blocks hanging open. It's just, yeah, probably not the best idea. So let's pretend that's not going to be the way we do it. Let's ask a better question of what we're actually trying to do. Oh, there was an animation. Oh, yeah. Let it fade in. Yeah. yeah. Huh. So we're going to translate from one language into another. That's, that's a thing that we know about. It's called transpilation or transfiguration if you want to be a turtle nerd about it. <laughs> we do this every day. Um, the trade me, you use a lot of TypeScript. We use a lot of SAS. Um, if you're doing ES 2018 or whatever we're at now, back to ES 3 or 5, you use Babel. Um, CoffeeScript, all the old, old things that we used to use. It's all these transpilation tools that give us not JavaScript into JavaScript or CSS or HTML, if whatever you want to do. Google literally defines it. This is the first result, so it's probably the best one. Um, as a, t a term for taking source code written in one language and transforming that into another language that has a similar level of, ab level of abstraction. So this is where our um, same type system thing comes in handy. We haven't changed anything with how we're managing memory or anything like that. We're basically just translating syntax. So let's think about syntax a bit more and work backwards. So if I have this little bit of JavaScript, it's pretty clearly made up of a few different things. So I have a string literal on the inside, then I have the function call, then I have a thing that identifies what that function is, so in this case, magic, and then the expression is the whole thing. So this one happens to have a semicolon. If you don't like that, sorry. What we can do with that is we can transform it into some sort of structure. So we have a string of JavaScript, and then we have this thing, which happens to conform to a spec called ES tree, which isn't an official spec. It's just something that a guy at Mozilla wrote 10 years ago, and somehow we all got stuck with, which seems to be the way with JavaScript. But it is, it is pretty well defined. Um, they're updating it all the time. It's got new features with it. It's got all the ES. 6, 2015 syntax, all that kind of stuff. And there's actually a tool for it. And it's essentially a parser. So it takes in a string of some code, and it returns you this other thing, which is called an AST. So what is an AST is the next logical question. This is a very bad answer. Um, it's abstract, so that's the first letter. A is abstract. It means it's disassociated from any specific instance. It's not related to language. It's not related to a particular bit of code. It's just abstract. It's syntax. So the syntax of any language is the things that makes it up. So English is syntax. Other languages, we all have syntax. JavaScript has its own syntax. So that's what we're defining in that, the structure. And then it's also a tree. So there's no cycles in the, in the graph. There's just a uh, structure that starts, and it dives down, and you go back up. It's not too complicated. Still, what? That, again, not helpful. Didn't help me when I first wrote it or learned it. So let's try to be a bit more visual about it. So it's a data structure that represents the structure of code without any actual syntax other than JSON in this instance. So again, on the left, we have three different bits of code in three different languages, two of which I made up, one of which I'd made up for this one slide. Top one's JavaScript, middle one, I don't know, something lispy, and in the middle, in the bottom, sorry, uh, parcel tongue. But on the right, they've all got the same AST. So that in itself is pretty great. You can see you have, at the bottom, an argument to a function with a callee with the identifier, which is magic. You have the string, uh, sorry, the, the literal that is that argument, which is the Wingardium Liviosa string. And then the whole thing is an expression statement, which is our entire program. So that's pretty cool. What that means is I don't think this one animates. But if we can get from parcel tongue to an AST, then we can go from that AST 
into JavaScript. So now we've got a few more steps. We know we have to somehow get to an AST. We don't know what we do to get to that, and we don't know what we do once we've got that, but let's keep going. How do we do that? So our naive approach was just a little bit too naive. Let's try something a bit more robust, so something that's actually a proven kind of thing that people do. First thing we're going to do is a process called lexing. And what that does is it gives us tokens. Again, more mystical words. What do they mean? So lexing is the process of breaking down the actual characters and the, and the characters from the string of code that you've been given and breaking them down into chunks that are actually relevant to the language. So in parcel tongue, we have these bits of our language. So we have an identifier. It's something that starts with S's. We have some white space. We have a punctuator, a thing that we define to be meaningful in the language. So in our case, the assignment operator or the return operator or whatever it is. Um, and we have a string literal, which is just a string. It could be a number. It could be a true or false. All these little tokens that are valid, meaningful things in our language. So if, again, I take this chunk of code, this Harry spell that we've got, and I pass a lexer over it, we get something like this, hopefully, yeah. A whole bunch of tokens. Cool, so we'd expect the first one. All right, it's an identifier, it's a spell thing. And then we have some white space, and we have another punctuator, and then some more white space, string literal, and you can see as you go along along, you have each individual component of the thing that makes up the text of that code, but we haven't inherently signed any meaning to any of them. You'll also note that we've got a position in the, um, in the whole string, and we've got a location object, which does some stuff that we'll talk about later. Keep doing that. So again, on the right, you see a whole bunch of tokens, all of which align with the code on the left. So now the next thing. So we've got uh, parcel time, we've lexed it, and now we've got a bunch of tokens. And so we're going to do that same thing we did before, which was passing it. So we're going to pass the tokens to an AST. And so what does that mean? So passing is loosely defined as the process of taking those tokens that we had and applying a grammar, so the things that structurally make up that language and make it valid code, and turning them into that AST. And so in our variable declaration example, we start with an identifier, and then some white space, and then a punctuator, and then some more white space, and a string literal. And if we happen to get those things in that exact order, we can be pretty confident that we've got a variable declaration. If it doesn't happen like that, we throw an error because it's not valid parcel time. Similarly with a function declarator. So it gets a bit more complicated. You have the identifier as before, and then some white space, and then a punctuator, which we again defined as part of our language. Another identifier, which would be the um, parameters for the function, comma, space, another parameter that would keep going until it's valid. And so you have this structure that defines the things that are valid in your language. And again, if you put a random star or another thing in there that wasn't meant to be there, we just throw an error. And we get the AST on the right-hand side. You see at the bottom that you've got the body there. So this is where the tree comes into play. So when I would be passing this function, I would get to the end of it, and I'd go, oh, sweet, I've found a new line. I know that I'm entering the body of my function. And so then your um, white space indentation mattering thing would happen, and you'd go, sweet, I've got an indentation token, and now I keep passing up, and these statements build up the body of my inner function. And so what would happen is if you did it on a whole script like that, you'd end up, hopefully, with something like this. So again, we have our code, and if I hit run, I have a tree. And so in here, I can see a thing that is totally built up that says I have a, a expector patronum literal that is part of a variable declarator, which has a name and an identifier of spell. And here, what we're doing, also important to note, is we've taken the name with the three S's at the start of it and stripped them off because we're going to use that later. And we have this variable declaration. And so then we have more statements, so this would be our function declaration. This would be uh, that var for the SS result thing, and then another one for the loop. And so it's e internal to each of those parts of the tree that have their own statements that build up that tree. 
So I already ran that one. Again, great. So now we just need to go from the AST that we have and turn that into JavaScript, which sounds <laughs> not fun because once you are playing with actually building up tokens of code, it's horrible and you're going to make mistakes and knowing where to put a semicolon becomes a very difficult problem. But it's JavaScript. We have NPM. We have these things that we can just import and then they do magical things for us. And so ES Code Gen is another one of those. And so that's part of, again, a suite of tools. So ES Prima that we saw before, that conform to that ES tree spec. And what ES Code Gen does is it takes a valid AST, pipes it in, and pipes out some JavaScript. Which, again, is basically magic. So if this works, I can't remember if I have to hit run on this one. No, I do. OK, so now we have our same code as before. But we've got one little extra line at the bottom. And so that is a cast, which is going to be a magical function that we prepared earlier and called it a global. And it's basically just alert. So if I run this, I think, ha, huh, we get an alert. So this has basically done the whole set of things. So we've, if we could look at the script here, let's actually run it again, because this should be interesting. Maybe. Cool. So we have a script, and we have some parcel time. We lex it, and we get out our tokens. We pass that, and we get out our AST. And then we give the AST to our generate function, and we end up with some JavaScript, which is pretty cool. Um, we're also doing some other magic in here, which means that I can just pass ES code gen a source map true, and it'll just make me have source maps. So not only do we run our code, I can come in here and I can go, oh, there's my code in the thing. And if I was to run this again with breakpoints, which I haven't actually figured out how to do, but it would stop at the right places. And instead of debugging the JavaScript that we created, we could just debug with parcel time. So we could rewrite the entire web in this language <laughs> if we so wanted to, which I'm working on. Um, <laughs> that is all well and good. But what is the actual? purpose of AST. It's like, yeah, cool, we can make fun languages. But every day, what do we do with those things? And so, yeah, we have uh, seven, magically seven steps. Parcel, um, so started in parcel sign, we lexed it, we had tokens, we passed those tokens into an AST, and then we used a code generator to get to JavaScript. So it's almost time to see if we could try to save Harry. And so Harry's still stuck in the internet, we can't forget about that, and he has a spell that he told us he's going to use. But there's a thing that can happen, and sometimes when someone is stuck on the internet for too long, they can kind of get a little bit nuts. And there's lots of, lots of kittens there, there's like lots of gifts, and if we're not safe, they may try to use one of the unforgivable functions. So, in a real world thing, this might be something like a console log, or throwing a random error, or a debugger statement, something that you don't want to get out into production. And so, when we have those things happen, what do we do? We go, huh, part of my build process. I should lint for that, or something else. So what we do with those things is we inspect the AST. So there's a whole t bunch of things that we might want to do. So code transforming, um, things like a standard, which actually reformat your code for you, um, linting itself. So ESLint, JSHint, uh, standard itself, um, TSLint. They're all built on ASTs. So you take in an AST, you look at it, you go, huh, that thing shouldn't be there, that weird bit of structure that I don't expect. Let's throw an error, let's throw a warning. Minifying, so Uglify, does the same thing. It goes, here's my AST. Um, I know all these identifiers. I know that I can just replace all of those with A, and then, sweet, we crunch down our code. Similarly, uh, mutating. So there's a thing called Striker, which is this mutation testing library, and it basically passes your code and goes, ha, huh, there's an addition operator. What happens if I make that a subtraction operator and run your tests, and you think they should fail? So again, what does that thing look like? One more tool from the magic of NPM, ES Query. So again, another thing from the ES Tools package, all for free. You basically go, give me an AST, give me some sort of query, run that, and I'll give you a bunch of nodes that match that thing. So with our unforgivable functions that we had before, we can use these query structures. And so we have a call expression where the callee's name is Imperio or Crucio or Avada Kedavra, and then the identifier after that. And so we could 
run that over the AST, and then we should expect to get the nodes out. And so this one should now be safe. So at the bottom there, you can see, ooh, oh, that would go scroll. So we did our call, but afterwards, Harry is gone internet crazy, and he's trying to kill us with his Avada Kedavra spell at the end. But because we added a fancy linting step, I can now see that while I did have an AST before, if I step into this, and I have my three curses, and I have this uh, query that I'm running, every time I come across that identifier, I just go, oh, no, no, you won't use that. And I just rename it to alert. And so then, when I get my AST back at the end, and we get some code out of that, you can see there's just an alert at the end. Sweet, no, no back magic, none of us are dying. And I can run this, and I get my first alert, which is great still. And oh no, the alert of nothing, because he tried to kill us, but he couldn't, because we linted. So always lint. <laughs> um, so yeah, we actually ended up with eight, where we should have had seven. Funny that. Um, so parcel tongue, lexing, tokens, parsing, AST, code inspection, code generation, and then through to JavaScript. And that's pretty much it, actually. So I have a bunch of resources I used. I stole this guy's ES1 parser, because it was cool. Um, I rewrote a bunch of it, because I did some different things, but I learned a lot about how early versions of JavaScript worked. Did you know they didn't have function expressions? I didn't. You couldn't just put a lambda in somewhere. Um, ES3, again, that spec, ES prima, ES code gen, ES query, all really great tools. Um, there's some really great resources on why we do compilation, why we do parsing. Um, a really cute tool for um, just turning like drawing instructions into a language and how you make the change from like thinking about processes into thinking about how they build up languages. Um, and then a whole bunch of source map stuff. Don't even try. It's black magic. I don't know how they work. Um, and then, of course, a bunch of Harry Potter gifts. And so, anyone got any questions? I'm going to put my hat on for this, because I feel bad not using it. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, and let's get the scarf out, too, because I did uh, borrow it off someone. Thanks, man. Um, I was just wondering about the limits of this approach. So is it really only possible to go from uh, JavaScript kind of uh, source languages to JavaScript? Like, what would happen if you changed the type system to be like a completely new um, paradigm? Like, would you have to make your um, transformation phase like a bit more powerful or? Um, yeah, a bit, a bit more powerful. The, the main thing that happens is you just have to generate more JavaScript. So instead of, um, instead of just going basically syntax to syntax, you can create more functions that are like a bit of preamble that sets up all your stuff for how you're going to manage your types. Or you can just do like what TypeScript does and just throw it away, make it mm -hmm. a be a build thing. Um, people transpile everything to JavaScript. Like, I'm sure you've seen them all. So there's, there's literally no limit to this. As long as you can come up with a way to take your code, turn it into a valid AST for JavaScript, then you can do what you want. You can do super crazy stuff like this, like invent a language in a weekend. You know, it's, it's pretty cool. Thank you. Other question? Um, did you have to write the lexer and the parser and all that yourself, how difficult is that? Um, not too difficult when you mostly copy other people's code, which is what we all do. Um, it's all on GitHub, actually. Um, if, if you want to look at it, this stupid thing is on GitHub. Um, there's Alexa there. It just it Literally, you read character by character and go, hey, do I expect this? Nope, throw an error. Yep, chuck it in an array. That bit's pretty straightforward. Passing, you go, huh, Alexa, do I expect this token? Yep, another one. Yep, same thing. Same process instead of going from characters to an array, you go from an array to a tree, and it's pretty straightforward. There's also tools for that. Um, there's a thing called JSON, which is like you basically give it a definition of your grammar, and it spits out a parser for you, which is probably what you'd do if you're actually doing this. That's how CoffeeScript works, for example. So Puzzletongue looks like a really expressive language, and I don't know if I'm going to write JavaScript for <laughs> much longer. So my question is, have you written, so if you want to flip it and go from JavaScript to 
your parcel tongue. Yeah. Have you done that yet? I have not. I literally finished this at like 1am. Oh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I wanted to know. It would be totally possible. Um, and you would just do exactly the same thing. So you'd take your JavaScript and we've already got a parser. You'd use a Prima, get your AST, and then we'd just have to write the code gen part. And so it would be pretty straightforward. So if you wanted a pull request, go nuts. <laughs> Great questions. We have time for one more quick question. If somebody got one at the back there. Hey there. So taking what you've learned from this, have you had any thoughts of how you might use it uh, on a more day-to-day -day kind of real world? Yeah, awesome question. Um, we do use it day-to-day. -day. Um, so I'm super pedantic about code. And so when someone does something in stuff at work and I don't like it, I, like, I write a lint rule. And so that is just, hey, pull out an AST. It happens to be a TypeScript AST for us. And we go, huh, you use that function name. I don't like it. It's got too many characters. Or you did five lines in a row of just white space. Go away. We do that. Um, we have some tooling around uh, um, automation testing, which allows uh, non-technical QAs to write protractor tests for Angular stuff. Um, that's all code gen. That's UI from the screen. Give me an AST. Write up some code. Um, if we're using transpilers or anything like that, we're all doing it today anyway. It's just quite cool to understand what's going on underneath. All righty. Sweet. That is awesome. Thank you so much, Craig. Let's have a big round of applause for Craig for an awesome presentation.